Over the last 2,000 years, countless books have been written and messages preached about the Messiah. The question is, were they true as to what we find in the Bible? For example, was he really born on December 25th? Did his death annul or remove the Old Testament commandments? Was he called by a Grecianized name? And will he return with only words of compassion and grace upon the wicked? Or in today's Discover the Truth, we're going to find out when we uncover the real Messiah. Stay tuned. From the time of the Messiah to our modern technological age, much Bible truth has been lost. With the melding of foreign philosophies and teachings unknown to the believers of the first century, the early church began a transformation away from its Hebrew origins. The question we need to ask ourselves is, just how far did it go? Join us for the next half hour as we take you on an incredible journey of biblical understanding as we uncover the foundation of the Christian faith. Are you ready to discover the truth? I'd like to welcome you to another Discover the Truth and say that it's an honor to be with you today. In this program, we're going to review and uncover the real Messiah. Much of what we hear about today regarding the Messiah simply does not hold up to the scrutiny of Scripture. For example, many describe our Savior as Greek or Roman. They will even often depict him as a European. They believe that he was born on December 25th, a day that had long been observed by the pagans in honor of the S-U-N. They also believe that his death removed the need to obey and that he will grant salvation to all without discrimination. Now, is this really the Messiah we find in Scripture? Well, the answer is no. The Messiah we find is far different. First, he was a Jew. He was born as a Jew, lived as a Jew, and, and yes, he even worshipped as a Jew. He was not born on December 25th, but most likely in the fall. Also, Yahshua the Messiah was an avid law keeper, not a law breaker. And as we'll find, he will certainly discriminate between the righteous and the wicked at his second coming. There is again a vast difference between the Messiah we hear about from today's pulpit and the Messiah we find in the Bible. Matter of fact, in many ways, it's almost as if they are diametrically opposed to one another. Now, why is it important that we understand the real Messiah? It's within this Messiah, listen, that we find a justification from sin and in the end, eternal life. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, we find there that he was born as a Jew. It says, the book of the generation of Yahshua the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judah and his brethren. From this we find that Yahshua was a Hebrew from the tribe of Judah. Again, our Savior was born as a Jew, lived as a Jew, and worshipped as a Jew. This is one of the most important truths that most ministers ignore today. Our Savior's genealogy and birthright is a foundation of who He was. Understand that if this foundation is replaced with a counterfeit, then the entire perception of who the Messiah was is altered. If there is any one truth that we must understand about the Messiah, it is His heritage. If we ignore this, then we ignore the cornerstone of our faith. Again, contrary to popular belief, our Savior was not born a Greek or a Roman, but a Jew. This is who he was. Now, speaking about his birth, when was the Messiah actually born? Was he born on December 25th, as many believe? Well, the answer is no. Matter of fact, this is easily proven. Most scholars will freely admit that he was likely not born during this time. For example, the New Catholic Encyclopedia says inexplicably, though it seems the, Messiah's, the date of the Messiah's birth is not known. The Gospels indicate neither the day nor the month. We find a second witness from the Encyclopedia Biblical, Theological, and Ecclesiastical Literature. It says, the fathers of the first three centuries do not speak of any special observance of the Nativity. No corresponding festival was presented by the Old Testament. 
The day and month of the birth of the Messiah are nowhere stated in the gospel history and cannot be certainly determined. We find here from scholarship that the exact time of the Messiah's birth is unknown. So how then did we arrive on December 25th? We find the answer in the Encyclopedia Britannica. We read, during the latter periods of Roman history, sun worship gained in importance and ultimately led to what has been called a solar monotheism. Nearly all the gods of the period were possessed of solar qualities, and both, listen, listen to this, Christ and Mithra acquired their traits of solar deities. The Feast of Sol Invictus, open and unconquered sun, on December 25th was celebrated with great joy. And eventually, the state was taken over by the Christians as Christmas, the birthday of Christ. So we find here that December 25th for the day of Yahshua's birth was actually borrowed from the Romans and possibly even further back. So if the Messiah was not born in December, when was he likely born? Well, while scripture doesn't provide an exact month or day, it does provide a clue as to the time or season of the year. We find this clue in Luke 1, beginning in verse 5, it says, there was in the days of Herod the king of Judea a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before Elohim, walking in all the commandments. So they were walking in the commandments, it says, and ordinances of Yahweh blameless. Now, where do we find evidence here for the Messiah's birth? Or in verse 5, we find that Zacharias, John the Baptist's father, served in the temple and was assigned to the course of Abia. Now, what's the significance of this course? In the Old Testament, there were 24 courses, and their cycle began on the first month, which corresponded in biblical times to the spring. Abia was of the eighth course. So from this, what can we determine? The first month would have fallen between late March and early April. If Zacharias then had the eighth course, his course would have fallen around the beginning of June. So based on this, John the Baptist was conceived somewhere around early June. Now before we can establish the Messiah's birth, there's one more piece to this puzzle. According to Luke chapter 1, verse 26, Elizabeth conceived six months before Miriam, Yahshua's mother. So based on this, when was Yahshua conceived? Now this requires just a little bit of math. If John the Baptist was conceived in early June, and if Yahshua was conceived six months later, what month was Yahshua likely conceived in? Or he was likely conceived in December, nine months later, placing his birth in somewhere around September. So when it comes to the birth of the Messiah, we find a discrepancy between tradition and what we actually find in the Bible. Tradition marks Yahshua's birth with the birthday of the S-U-N, as again observed by the Romans hundreds of years before. While the Bible shows that he was likely born in the fall. We're going to take a quick break now, so stay tuned. Many have misconceptions about who the Messiah really was and what he taught. From his physical appearance to the name he was known and called by, popular beliefs about the greatest figure in human history hold many fabrications and inaccuracies. Was he born on December 25th, the same day revered by sun worshippers for centuries before his birth? What was the method of his death? Did he do away with biblical law? Did he have brothers and sisters? Why did he come to earth? Find out why the most revered figure in history has so many misconceptions surrounding him. Peel away centuries of ancient Greek and Roman influence and look at the Messiah from the proper perspective of his Hebraic upbringing and culture. To understand the Hebrew roots of the Messiah is to unlock who he really is. Request our free booklet, The True Messiah. Read or order online at yrm.org or write Discover the Truth, P.O. Box 463, Holt Summit, Missouri, 65043.
Welcome back. One of the most misunderstood truths pertaining to the Messiah is his name. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, it says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yahshua, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now your Bible probably says, And thou shalt call his name Jesus. Or well, in the Greek, this name comes from Jesus, meaning and being derived from the Hebrew Joshua or Yahshua. According to the Greek diaglot, the name of Jesus is composed of Yah, I shall be in Shua, powerful, Yahshua. Now what again did the angel tell Joseph in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21? He told him that his son's name would be called Yahshua. Why? Because he would save his people from their sins. It's crucial to understand that names have meaning. The name Yahshua literally means Yahweh is salvation. You see, the purpose of the Messiah is tied to his name. Through his name, we understand that our Savior brought salvation to mankind through his Father in heaven. Understand that when we use other names, we lose this meaning and purpose. This is no different from believing that our Savior's faith was Grecian or Roman instead of Hebraic. You see, when we depart from the identity of our Savior, we lose sight of truth, of who he really was and what he represented. It's important that we understand that there's no equivalent to the name of Yahshua. Only through this name do we find the message and hope of salvation, as we find in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Now, we also find from Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2, that he probably looked differently from what's most often shown. It says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. This prophecy is a description of our Savior. Matter of fact, it's one of the most treasured of all prophecies within the Old Testament. It says here that the Messiah had no comeliness or beauty, and that there was no reason to desire him. Based on this, our Savior's appearance was nothing out of the ordinary. Tell me, how is the Messiah most often represented today? Normally, he's portrayed as a tall, handsome European, much different from what we find in Scripture. Listen, friends, our Savior wasn't European. He was a Jew, so you would expect him to look like a Jew. So even the traditional depiction of our Savior seems to be at odds with what we find in Scripture. When it comes to the Messiah, our Savior, many simply have a false impression of who he was, from his genealogy to his appearance. Again, our Savior was a Hebrew from the tribe of Judah. He had a Hebrew name, Yahshua, and he looked like an ordinary Jew. Now, another traditional belief of the Messiah is that his death removed the need to obey, and as a result, we rely only today on faith and grace. Understand that nothing could be further from the truth. Through Yahshua's own testimony, we find many examples of him upholding the need to obey. For instance, we find evidence of this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. He says there, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so. He shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is one of the first recorded passages of our Savior in the New Testament. What did he say here? He said here that he came not to destroy, but to do what? Fulfill, meaning what? To complete. You know, it's amazing that one of Yahshua's first words were in reference to the thought of him abolishing the law. It's almost as if he saw this happening. He said that as long as heaven and earth existed, that not one jot or tittle would pass away from the commandments. For those who may not know, the jot corresponds to the Hebrew yod, which is the smallest of all the Hebrew letters. Last time I checked, heaven and earth still existed. So according to our Savior, not even the smallest letter has passed from the law. 
Now for those who may continue to say that our Savior abolished the Old Testament law, he also said here that whoever breaks the least of these commandments would be least, listen, least in the kingdom of heaven. So the Messiah unequivocally confirms here that his coming was not to remove or destroy the law or the commandments. We can find another example of this in Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. Yahshua says there, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good, Master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, well, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is Elohim. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, Which? Yahshua said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. What message do we find here? Yahshua explains what a person must do to achieve eternal life. What was his answer to this young rich man? Did he say here that all we must do is believe and have faith? <laughs> the answer is no. Instead, we find Yahshua telling this young rich man that he should do what? He should keep and obey the commandments. So friends, we find here again the Messiah undeniably confirming his devotion to the Old Testament commandments. It was again never his intention or purpose to set aside or undo his father word that he established in the Old. Matter of fact, time and again, did he publicly endorse the concept of obedience? You know, Paul in Romans 7 verse 12 said that the law was holy, righteous, and good. It's amazing how something so positive can be viewed so negative. I believe our Savior in the eyes of many today would be seen as a legalist, trying to earn his salvation through works righteousness. So does obeying the commandments make one a legalist? Or the answer is no. Or stay tuned. We'll be back in just a short moment. Many have misconceptions about who the Messiah really was and what he taught. From his physical appearance to the name he was known and called by, popular beliefs about the greatest figure in human history hold many fabrications and inaccuracies. Was he born on December 25th, the same day revered by sun worshippers for centuries before his birth? What was the method of his death? Did he do away with biblical law? Did he have brothers and sisters? Why did he come to earth? Find out why the most revered figure in history has so many misconceptions surrounding him. Peel away centuries of ancient Greek and Roman influence and look at the Messiah from the proper perspective of his Hebraic upbringing and culture. To understand the Hebrew roots of the Messiah is to unlock who he really is. Request our free booklet, The True Messiah. Read or order online at yrm.org. Or write, Discover the Truth, P.O. Box 463, Holt Summit, Missouri, 65043. If you are one of many searching for weekly Hebrew Roots worship, then join us live every Saturday at 1.30 p.m. Central Time on our website, yrm.org. Be among many others from all over the world, enjoying eye-opening messages and inspiring music as Yahweh's Word comes to you every Sabbath from the Yahweh's Restoration Ministry Headquarters in Holt Summit, Missouri. We hope to see you there this Sabbath. Well, welcome back. Let me ask you this, do we earn a salvation by obeying the commandments? Well, the answer to that is no. Why then should we obey? Or we should obey because scripture says to obey. This is a method by which we show our devotion and love to our Father in heaven. 
According to 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, those who love Yahweh will keep His commandments. Listen, they will keep His commandments and will do so without grievance. So again, we find here a dichotomy between the traditional Messiah and the Messiah of Scripture. One supposedly removed the law, and the other stated, He came not to destroy the law. Now in Revelation chapter 6, verse 15, we find there that our Savior is coming back in wrath. It says, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every freeman hid themselves in the dens of the rocks of the mountains, and said to the rock, mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? You know, most have this perception that the Messiah is going to return and reward everyone with salvation, regardless of what kind of life they lived. In this passage, we find a far different Messiah. It says here that men, no matter of position or rank, will hide themselves from Yahshua's anger. They will literally cry out to the rocks, saying, Fall on us and hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. You see, our Savior's returning in wrath. He's coming back to judge a world for us rebellion and sin. Contrary to what many might believe, he's not returning as a gentle lamb, but as a king and as a warrior. When the sinners of this world see the coming of Yahshua, they will stand in fear and trepidation because they will know that their hour has finally come. Again, this is a far different vision and message from what we hear from most ministers today. Most paint Yahshua only as a loving Savior who would never cause harm to anyone. As we find here, though, this is only wishful thinking. The vast majority believe that they can live as they determine, as they see fit. And in the end, somehow their Father in Heaven will simply show mercy for the rebellion and neglect and grant them eternal life. Understand the Scripture says that once we know the truth, we're then held accountable or responsible to that truth. And as a result, we'll be judged accordingly. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, we again find a description of Yahshua's second coming. He says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Friends, this is speaking about the Messiah. Where he continues in verse 12. He says, His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of Yahweh. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress. Listen, he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of El Shaddai. We find here another passage depicting our Savior's return to this earth. It says that He's coming to judge and make war. It says that His eyes are like flames of fire. It says that He will come with a sharp sword and it will strike the nations. It says that He will tread the winepress with wrath. Our Savior's coming to make war with those who defy His Father in heaven. Again, this is certainly not not what we hear about with the traditional Messiah, but yet this is what we find within the Word. So we find again once more a contradiction between the traditional Messiah and the Messiah of Scripture. Now why is it important that we understand these differences? Number one, the Messiah is the only one who redeems us from our sins. Understand that. Without Him we all would be lost in our iniquities without any hope of redemption. Number two, we're told in 1 Peter 2.21 that we're to follow in His examples. To receive salvation from our Savior and certainly, certainly to follow in His examples. We need to understand what He believed and how He lived. If we have a false perception of our Savior, then we will not be able to follow in His examples. As we've seen through this message, there are significant major differences between the traditional Messiah and the one we find in Scripture. 
If we truly desire to follow in the footsteps of our Savior, then we need to strive to understand who He was when He walked this earth. Again, only through our Savior do we find redemption from our sins. If we ignore who He was and what He believed, then we jeopardize our own salvation. Well, I pray that you would consider what's been said today and that you would join us next time and discover the truth, but that you would also spend time on our webpage. And the offer this week, the booklet, is The True Messiah. And within this booklet, we cover many of the false perceptions, many of the false truths that we've heard today in this program. The day that he was supposedly born, the theology or word that he supposedly taught. Or this was not the Messiah we find in Scripture. Again, friends, we need to understand the truth of our Savior. We need to understand what he believed, how he lived, what he taught as our example. Because again, we're to follow in those footsteps. We're to do as he did. We're to walk as he walked. We're to worship as he worshiped. So friends, it's imperative that we understand this message, that we understand the beliefs that he upheld, the Torah that he taught, and that he taught his apostles. And they then in turn taught those in the early assembly. This is the Messiah we worship today. This is the one we rely on, on salvation and redemption. It is only through his blood, friends. It is only through his sacrifice. It is only through his propitiation that we find salvation today. This is not a truth that we can ignore. This is not a truth that we can cast aside. This is a truth that we must embrace, that we must live by that we must strive to follow. So again, I would pray that you would watch us next time and that you would embrace what's been said. May Yahweh bless you. Thank you for watching today. We invite you to take advantage of today's free offer by calling 1-573-896-1000 or write to Discover the Truth, P.O. Box 463, Holt Summit, Missouri 65043. Be sure to visit our website at yrm.org. There you can read and request dozens of free booklets, watch hundreds of sermons, or tune in live every Sabbath. Set your DVRs and join us right here next week. Discover the Truth is produced by Yahweh's Restoration Ministry, a nonprofit organization.